Okay, everybody, before we even get started on this lesson, it is uh, late afternoon on the west coast of Florida in January, and uh, I decided to imbibe in my a little bit of a beer. Cheers. Because after all, gems are supposed to be fun. So take your favorite beverage, beer, wine, hard liquor, Shirley Temple, whatever. And let's get on with our next lesson. Well, hello everybody. Welcome back into the Colored Gemstone Academy. My name is Paul DC, your instructor, and this is my YouTube channel, Paul DC Gemstones. At the time of this taping, which is January 29th, 2021, uh, we are up to 860 subscribers on this channel, and I couldn't have done it without you. I appreciate each and every one of you. I still have the goal of becoming the biggest free classroom of gemstones on a weekly show that costs you nothing on YouTube. So share with your friends, uh, subscribe if you haven't done so. I really, really do appreciate it. This lesson is going to be very different and very interesting. This comes from a subscriber by the name of Richard who said, I would love to have you do a show or a lesson on Covalite. And that's what we're gonna do today. Well, what makes this so interesting to me is not all minerals have, are destined to be in jewelry. And that's what I would say about this gemstone. It's not that you couldn't do it, it's just not very practical. What is Covalite? Covalite is a, a, a mineral, I call it a secondary copper mineral. It's copper sulfide. And so wherever copper is, is where you might find the covalite. So you find, where do you find it? It's throughout the world, Central Europe, uh, China, Australia, Western United States, Argentina. And just like I mentioned with turquoise, Remember, turquoise is found in and around copper deposits. Well, that's the same thing of covalite. It's, it, it's, fo it's found around where copper is mined. Now, how did it get, get the name covalite? Well, actually, it was discovered in the 1800s, I believe it was, and the uh, gentleman's name is Nicola Covelli. And he was born in 1790, he died in 1829, so sometime in the probably early 1800s. He discovered this, and he was a professor of botany and chemistry, though he was interested in geology and volcanology, so volcanoes. So he was actually doing some studies around Pompeii, where they had, of course, that big volcanic eruption all those years ago, and that's where he discovered the covalite. Now, when you look at covalite, it is very, very beautiful. It's an iridescent uh, gemstone. And you'll see shades of blue, maybe shades of a little bit of purple uh, in, in the covalite. And, um, but, and, and actually, I can even show you some uh, carvings, like a skull made out of Covalite, and you're saying, well, wait a minute, Paul, why is it not really suitable so much for gemstones? Well, remember those things we always talk about, the kind of boring part of the gemstone business, which is the, you know, the hardness, the toughness, the stability, all of those things? Well, let's talk about that. Okay, so we talked about the chemical composition, copper sulfide. So obviously copper is a very important component of that. Uh, the crystal structure is hexagonal. And that those of you that will remember when we talked about last week's lesson, which was on marcasite, and we called that an iron sulfide. And so, and then we talked about marcasite and pyrite and the difference, but white iron pyrite and the differences between them. Remember, one of those was uh, trigonal, one of those was cubic. Well, this one is hexagonal crystal structure. But this is where it gets really dicey. So the hardness is between 1.5 and 2. Now think about that. Talc is a 1 on the most scale of hardness. When you're getting into um, like a, a, a quartz, that's a 7. You're getting into a sapphire, that's a 9 
on the hardness scale. If you're getting into diamonds, that's a 10 on the Mohs scale of hardness. Remember, that's literally the ability to scratch from one gem to scratch another gem. So almost everything is going to scratch the covalite. It's very, very susceptible because it has a very low hardness. Its toughness isn't all that great either. Toughness is, again, the ability to withstand uh, cracking and chipping. So not going to be a great one to have as a gem that you wear every single day. So we've established hardness, only 1.5 to 2. Toughness, not all that great either. Refractive index, 1.45 to 2.63 about. Um, so, okay, it's, it's not something that's going to sparkle like a diamond. Specific gravity, remember, that's the heft. That's uh, how heavy something feels in relation to its size. Um, 4.68, that's pretty high, actually. So remember, we always talk about sapphire being that kind of standard bear, bearer as a 4. In the specific gravity, this is actually a little bit more than that, 4.68. Uh, it also does have an optical phenomenon. And if those of you who haven't seen the lesson on phenomenal gems, I highly recommend you watch that. I'll, I'll put the information on what episode that is uh, on your screen. But it exhibits an optical phenomenon, and it is called iridescence. That's also something we see a lot in pearls. Iridescence is that sort of, uh, I call it like an oil slick that you see in certain pearls. It's this kind of a rainbow effect when uh, the sun hits uh, an oil slick with water on it, that's iridescence. And when you look at your screen, that iridescence is very prominent in this covalite stone. So again, I talk about this as not being something that's really great, perhaps, in the world of jewelry to wear, but for collectors, it is a spectacular specimen. If you go to uh, the western part of the United States, wherever that you see a lot of copper mining, whether that's Arizona, or whether that's uh, Nevada, it's, it's um, in New Mexico. Well, there's also sizable deposits for this gemstone in Montana. And interestingly, there have been some big uh, specimens that have been located in Montana. But they also have something called the Covalite Theater. And it was a couple of things over the past. It was like a Presbyterian church, and then it became a multi-use facility. And it still uh, exists today. You might see plays or bands uh, playing there. But it was named after the Covalite, which I thought was kind of interesting. And as far as some of the uh, esoteric or some of the mystical properties in some crystals that people talk about with Covalite, um, it is a stone that will help you transform your dreams into reality by infusing with positivity, especially if you pair it with turquoise. Well, that's kind of smart to pair it with turquoise. It will also help you achieve a positive outlook, and this positive outlook will help you manifest these dreams into your real life. Now, I don't know if you believe all of those things or not. One thing that I've always said, there is something mystical, mystical about crystals, and I think it would be hasty of us to call people who believe in those things crazy because crystals have been around for billions of years and man, really not so long. And I have seen some amazing things. Each crystal has a vibration, so who knows, maybe these, these things really have an effect. But now we're going to get to the part of the lesson that I find the most interesting about this gem, even though I don't call it a gem suitable for wearing in jewelry. Covalite is the first identified naturally occurring superconductor. Okay, so what is a superconductor? Superconductors are something that um, people have been trying to harvest for many, many, many years. Why? Because it has big uh, meaning in the world of like electricity and no degradation of the electrical signal. Uh, it's great in lithium. It's great for uh, the future of batteries. You know, as we talk about solar power, solar um, devices, uh, gas sensing equipment, these are the, the uses of a superconductor. Also really, really big in the computer industry. 
So what makes this very fascinating to me is as we look at the future, as we start going to more and more solar energy, Judy and I live in a house that is uh, has a lot of solar energy. We're basically a zero energy home. Uh, battery storage, whether you're talking about electric cars or you're talking about solar panels on your roof, um, storage becomes a really big concern of that. And these superconductors are going to be the pathway to having more almost unlimited battery storage for things like solar energy. So this is going to be kind of a, an important mineral going forward. In fact, there are several people that are trying to reproduce covalite synthetically. When we talk about uh, uh, lab-created or man-made gemstones, which I've talked about in the past, whether it's emeralds or sapphires or diamonds, uh, but people are trying to synthetically reproduce the covalite that naturally occurring, the only naturally occurring superconductor that might have far-reaching ramifications in the future for our country. So I thought that was really interesting and I really appreciated Richard asking me to do this lesson because it's not one that I own any specimens of, but it really is an important in the grand scheme of things, whether you love it just because it, you want to collect it or whether you're thinking about the future, what it could do to mankind. Well, that's going to do it for this particular lesson, albeit a little brief one on Covalite. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, please uh, subscribe if you've not done so. Remember, I know the word says subscribe, but it doesn't cost you a penny. It's completely free, but it really does help me continue to do these lessons for you all around the world. Thank you so much, and I'll see you all next week. Thanks for watching.